All right, Psalm 85 is not a very long psalm. We've got 13 verses here, and um, a lot of this is similar. We see references to, to sin, the iniquity of the people. We see um, forgiveness from God. This is, is more of a positive psalm, and it's just a high-level overview of the psalm before we dig into the verses here. And um, the asking of God to... to you know, to bless and to uh, not be angry with them. And then we see some, some of the blessings following through of the Lord and uh, righteousness here. So let's dig in here to verse number one. The Bible says, Lord, thou hast been favorable unto thy land. Thou hast brought back the captivity of Jacob. So the first verse is setting us up with um, where we're at, right? This is after... Uh, children of Israel are being brought back out of captivity. So uh, it doesn't necessarily say which captivity. I don't think that that's necessarily important. It's just referencing a captivity, a time when the children of Israel have gone astray and then they're coming back to the Lord. And I mean, this may be prophetic from that time, but I would say it doesn't really matter because we're, you know, I want to just dig more into. Just how God works is a very good summary of how God works in general. And this is from the vantage point, from the standpoint of having now finished going through a chastening of the Lord as a people. This is that, you know, Israel as a whole is coming out of being captive. They've turned from the Lord. Now they're being brought back out of captivity and verse 2 says, Thou hast forgiven the iniquity of thy people. Thou hast covered all their sin. Selah. So they've received the forgiveness of God. God brought them back. They, they have now passed that point of, of what their tra whatever transgression was. God has forgiven that iniquity. He's covered all of their sin. Verse 3, Thou hast taken away all thy wrath. Thou hast turned thyself from the fierceness of thine anger. Verse 4, turn us, O God of our salvation, and cause thine anger toward us to cease. So we see here three times, the first three verses ex expressing, look, we've been forgiven, our sins are covered, you know, you've taken away your wrath, the, the fierceness of your anger, the, you've kind of crossed that point to where they're, they're getting back in good standing with the Lord, and you know, as we go through this, this is referring to, uh, you know, the, the, the nation, the land, the people of God as a, a collective. And I'm going to address it that way, but obviously you can still apply most of this individually as well. So when you go through your own chastening and your own uh, times where, where God might have to punish you for your sins and your, you know, uh, disobedience and stiff neckedness that, that, you know, when, when you return to the Lord and you uh, humble yourself and you seek God then uh, and he forgives you then, covers your sin and then takes away his wrath from you, you're in a, you know, you're going to be in this state where you're, uh, one, very thankful because you've received that forgiveness from, from the Lord, which is, which is great. And you're, you're starting to get back in good, in good graces. But at the same time, this is also a very good place to, you know, you're not far removed from that captivity, from the punishment. And you're just, you're, you're probably going to be treading very lightly going like, like, thank you, like, like, thank you for not, you know, for, for, for your wrath, you know, toning that down and taking away your wrath. But, but please don't. Don't be angry with me again. <laughs> you know, like, uh, uh, turn us. It was just, the Bible says here, turn us, O God of our salvation. Like, like, you know, get us on the right path is what this is saying. And I, I just want to express this real quick in, in verse number four here when it says, turn us, O God of our salvation, cause thine anger toward us to cease. This, this does not negate any type of free will. You can look at this statement and don't, and, and what I wouldn't do is when it says, turn us, oh God, that's not saying, like, like a lot of people, and, and this is very understandable, I think, you would like to just be able to let God just run your life for you, right? Like where you could just be like, God, like if you just had a switch, you could turn right now and just be like, God, just take over and run my life for me. I would like to be able to do that because then you just be guaranteed like, like, all right, well then God's just going to do everything that 
is good for me, what, what's right, what I should be doing. But that's not how God operates. See, like, we, we don't believe in, in the God of John Kelvin. That, that just everything happens to, to what he says it's going to be, and, and it's all predetermined, it's all predestinated, and God's just like a puppet master controlling the strings of everybody and everything that they do. That is completely false. We don't uh, subscribe to that, not even a little bit. So when the Bible says, turn us, O God of our salvation, obviously we want God to direct us. We want God to be with us. We want God to show us the right way, which is ultimately how this uh, psalm ends up. So look at verse number 13. This is where we get this, you know, this, this conclusion of the thought to, you know, hey, look, we've done wrong. We, we've, we've sinned. We've gone into captivity. We've been punished for that. Now, God, you know, turn us back to you, back to serving you. Get our minds straight. Help us to walk the right path. Show us the way forward from here. Turn us. We, we don't want to go back to where we were before. Turn us the right way. And this has to do with getting direction, getting guidance from the Lord. Verse number 13 there in, in Psalm 85, the Bible says, Righteousness shall go before him and shall set us in the way of his steps. This is what they were looking for. Of course, it, it concludes with that. But this is the whole point of saying, turn us, right? Show us the right way. Go back in our life and, and give us the guidance that we need. And as I was preparing for this sermon, there's a couple of, of passages that came up uh, that just made me think about other portions of Scripture. If you want to keep your place here, um, and turn if you would to Amos chapter number 8. This desire, this request for God to, hey, turn us, turn us back right again. Get us, get us in the right way. Uh, verse number five, I'm going to read for you in Psalm 85. I meant to, to read this before we turn to Amos 8. He says, Wilt thou be angry with us forever? Wilt thou draw out thine anger to all generations? Wilt thou not revive us again that thy people may rejoice in thee? And it's this, this still this feeling of making, you know, like God, Please don't just cast us off forever. Don't be angry with us forever. You know, we've, they already know that they've been forgiven. God's brought them back. But the desire here is to not want to have the anger of the Lord in their lives anymore. They want to, they want to get right. And this is the right heart that is, has to be there in order for them to even be brought back and to receive that forgiveness anyways. It's that repentant heart and looking for the right way. But... What and this is this is the concern I think that that they're worried about is what the Bible says in Amos chapter eight when the people have sinned greatly and they're being judged. Look at verse number ten of Amos chapter eight. The Bible says, "And I will turn your feasts into mourning, and all your songs into lamentation." And and before I even continue here, I mean this is just such a basic principle overall, going all the way back to the law, all the way back to the first five books. Uh, of Moses going back to um, where God just promises like, hey, here's my law. You keep my law and I will bless you. And I'm going to multiply your, you know, your seed. I'm going to multiply the crops. I'm going to, you know, protect you. I'll be your defender. You know, one of you shall chase 10, 10 of you shall chase a thousand. Like, like you're going to be blessed and I'll, and I'll be there for you and I'll be your God and you'll be my people. But if you disobey me, then things are going to go bad. Then I'm going to allow you to be brought into captivity. You know, you're, you're not going to be reaping uh, anything good out of the land. You're going, to, you're going to go into all kinds of problems. So we're see, we see this play out over and over and over and over and over and over and over again throughout Scripture. And you see it play out, I'm sure, just in life in general, whether it be your life or people that you know, um, people just having no regard for the Lord. And especially his people and, you know, Christians that just get out of the will of God and just have no regard for serving God, no regard for doing anything for the Lord, they end up not being blessed uh, just in general and, and seem to have a lot of problems 
that um, that wouldn't otherwise be there. Look at, uh, let's keep reading here, verse number 10. I will turn your feasts into mourning and all your songs into lamentation, and I will bring up sackcloth upon all loins and baldness upon every head, and I will make it as the morning of an only son and the end thereof as a bitter day. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. And they shall wander from sea to sea and from the north even to the east. They shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord and shall not find it. And this is, that's a scary place to be. He's, he's not only is he saying, you know, I'm going to turn your feasts in the morning, your songs in lamentation. You're going to be going through these curses. But then you're going to want to know what the Lord has to say. You're going to want to get that direction from the Lord. You want to be God to be with you, God to answer you, God to hear your prayers, and God to guide you. And you're not going to be able to find it. And you're going to be trying to find the word of the Lord. And you're going to be running to and fro and trying to find who's got a message from the Lord, who's got a word from the Lord. And you're not going to find anything. There's a famine in the land of God communicating, of God guiding, of God directing the people. And this is a place where you don't want to be in. And this is the concern and this is the request. Hey, turn us, oh God, you know, like, like be there for us, guide us, show us the right way. Because uh, obviously, as, as we saw in Amos, and turn back if you were to Psalm 85, as you can see in Amos, you can get to that point. The people can get to that point. The nation can get to that point to where... You know, they've sinned and sinned and sinned against the Lord, and now he's punishing them, and now they're not even receiving of the Lord. They're not receiving the right guidance and, and the right instruction that they would need. We saw that in King Saul's life, right? Remember, he sinned and sinned and sinned and sinned. He didn't humble himself and thought that he could do everything. And then when he wants to seek the Lord and he wants counsel from God, he goes and he's trying to ask counsel. He's like, God doesn't answer and then he takes it so far as to go see a witch and try to bring up Samuel to give him word from the Lord, right? Which is extremely wicked. And, and he ends up dying, of course, and getting killed in battle. And they desecrate his body, his, his son. Him and his sons die in battle and um, as a result of his disobedience. But we see that God will get to that point to where, you know, if you... If you push things too far, that he just, he just won't be there for you. He won't be there to answer your requests, to guide you, to, to give you the instruction that you need. Now, again, I, I'll bring this up probably as much as I feel I need to. I think everyone here already understands this, but we already believe that, you know, there's no way a believer could ever lose their salvation. Even King Saul didn't lose his salvation. When he was able to speak with Samuel the day before he died, Samuel prophesied to him and said, tomorrow, uh, you know, that you'll be with me that you and your sons are going to be with me. And there's no indication that Samuel wasn't saved as a prophet of the Lord. We wholeheartedly believe that Samuel was a prophet, that he was saved, he was a man of God. And if he was saying, you're going to be with me, then Samuel wasn't burning in hell. So we can take pr uh, that as proof that uh, Samuel prophesied the truth unto him and that when he died, he was with him. Not to mention that the Bible says that, you know, God gave him another heart and that Saul prophesied just like the prophets and, and all these other things. We have plenty of evidence to show us that King Saul was saved and we know that salvation is eternal and that can never be taken away even when you do bad. You, you know, God's people, you do bad things. Hey, God's going to punish you. He's going to chasten you. He may uh, get to the point to where he's not going to listen to you because you've been too disobedient and you need to be punished some more. But his loving kindness, his mercy is never fully taken away from you. That you still have that salvation. You're still a child of God and you still have a home in heaven. So, the, the plea here in Psalm 85 is just, you know, basically to not be angry forever and, and to, to guide them now. And, and now that they're seeking him, please show us the way and guide us the way that we ought to go. Um, verse number six says, wilt thou not revive us again? And revive, of course, means to be brought back to life. So like they, in the sense that we were serving you before, we we're walking the right way, the path of righteousness, we fell, we transgressed, 
Now you've forgiven us. Now revive us again. Bring us back to be able to serve you again, to be fruitful again, and to be a, a people that could bring you honor and glory again, that thy people may rejoice in thee. And, and basically be able to be used again, right, of the Lord. And this should be a concern. If you've got your heart right with the Lord, it, it's a scary place to be in, uh, you know, for us, um, especially once you know, you, you, you know, let's say you're someone who's, you know what it's like to serve the Lord. You, you've, you know, you go soul winning, you pray, you read your Bible, you've served God, you've experienced the blessing of God in your life, and then something happens and you end up, you know, backsliding and kind of getting out of the things of God, and maybe, maybe you commit some, some bad sin, some type of grievous sin, and then you get to the point where you're like, man, what have I done? And you want to turn back to God, and you find that God is a merciful God, and there is forgiveness with the Lord, and then you get back, well, you're going to want God to still be able to use you again. Right? You're going to want to not just get out of the fight. And I would just encourage you, you're all here in church with us tonight. If this ever happens to you, and I pray that it won't ever happen, but just being in church long enough, you will see people come and go through church. It happens. It happens. It happens to really good people. It happens to people that you love. It happens to people that you care about that have been on fire for the Lord and that you would never think would ever drop out of church and just kind of go by the wayside, but it happens. And, and all I can do is while you're here, just stress, look, do your best for that not to happen. But if you find yourself in that position where you have backslidden, you have committed sins, you, you, you're, you're ashamed, you're whatever, you know, you, you, you're you know, you're guilty of, of whatever it is before God and God's chasing you and God's, you know, quote unquote brought you into captivity in, in however, however that needs to be handled for your case with the Lord, that you would turn to him, but then seek to be used of him again. And don't be so proud that you can't show back up to church. And even if you never go back to the same church, if you don't come back to this church, for example, go back to church and start serving the Lord again. And don't get the defeated attitude. Look, if you're still alive, God has something more for you to do. Because if God was done with you, then he'd be done. Look, as a child of God especially, if he were done with you in this life, you wouldn't be here. You wouldn't be here. So there's clearly more for you to do. So I would just, just remember that. And as you're thanking God for his mercy and thanking God for, for not, you know, taking away his wrath and, and turning himself from his fierce anger on you, if you, you know, when you get to that point, as, as the Bible's describing here, that you would seek to be revived again in the sense of being renewed, being able to, to go back now, start fresh, start new, and serve the Lord again. And I'll tell you this much from our church, okay, and I can't control how every person behaves, obviously, but I think I know the people here well enough. You come back here, no one's going to say anything or question you or hound you. And you know what? If you were thinking that way, don't ever do that. <laughs> Someone you know has been out of church for a long time, just welcome them hey, it's great to see you. God bless you. It's, uh, man, I'm so happy you're here, yep. right? And you don't need to bother asking about what all the, oh, oh, well, how did you, could you possibly do that? Where have you been, huh? What have you been, you know, like, <laughs> no, we don't do that, okay? You want people to be able to, look, if they're already coming, you know, willing to, to come back, like, let's welcome them. There's, you know, whatever happened, now, they're seeking the Lord again. Great. We're happy about that. We're going to rejoice and just let whatever that is be, whatever is between them and the Lord that got them out of serving God, whatever they were doing, none of our business. Let's just be able to, to keep moving forward, and we ought to be able to, to do that and allow other people to do that. And I say that here so that way when, if that ever happens to you, don't think like, oh, what's everyone going to think? And everyone's going to, you know, you know what people are going to think, honestly? The, you know, the, at least the righteous people are going to be thinking, wow, I'm so glad they're back. And I can think of many people right now, many people right now, 
that no longer attend our church, that could come to our church, that I would be, if they walked through those doors, I would just be really happy that they're here. And the only people that I would not be happy about are the ones that got kicked out <laughs> because they're perverts. <laughs> okay? Those guys, no. But that's it, right? I mean, every, anyone else, and, and you know, I don't think there's been anyone kicked out for any other reason. We haven't kicked out that many people. You know, we're not, not even that old of a church, but people have left, right? Some people have left because whatever, because of me, because of something that I teach. Other people have left for just probably their own personal reasons. Who knows? I don't know what all the reasons are why people leave. And you know what? I don't go out of my way to ask people in general, you know, if, if you're going to leave, uh, and let me, and this is just a good opportunity just to kind of cover this right now anyways. If people are going to leave here, I'm not going to go and try to run after and chase after people that leave. But that doesn't mean that I don't care. Okay, I care tremendously. But I may reach out because I do care but I'm not going to, you know, bend over backwards to try to get, you know, if there's a reason why you're leaving and, and you know, if someone's going to leave our church, I would hope that more time or whatever, you know, something got into that point where I don't, what's it going to matter what I say? If, if it's a matter of what I'm teaching, well, I'm not going to change what I teach in order to get somebody to stay is, is one of the ways I look at that. So, I, I just, you know, if, if, if that's a reason for someone departing from our church, I, I don't really see much of a point in that. And if they feel like it's bad enough, then that I can't be part of the church and I have to leave. Well, then that's, that's on you. It doesn't mean I don't care. It doesn't mean that I want you to leave or anything like that. But I'm not going to go trying to run after and chase after people if that's the case. You come to that conclusion, then, then God bless you. That's your conclusion. And go, you know, but serve the Lord somewhere else. And that's fine. Right? So that's just my mindset, and I think it's important to just understand that. Um, it, it's not like a pride issue or anything for me. It's I'm not too proud. I just, you know, I, I, try to, I try to not get into, your all, into anybody's lives too much here at all. I, I don't want to pry. I don't want to, you know, just get into personal matters a whole lot in general. I, 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 I really agree with people being independent and coming up to your own conclusions. And I've expressed multiple times, if you have an issue, come and talk to me about it. And I'm happy to talk about, you know, whatever your issue is, bring it up to me. I'll talk to you about it. And if I'm wrong about something, then let me know. And, and, but just bring the Bible, bring facts to the, to the discussion. Uh, and I, I will listen to that. And no way am I going to guarantee that I'll change my mind because I don't know. I have to hear what, <laughs> hear whatever it is that people have to say before I would say that. But in my heart, I'm open to being corrected and changing my mind about things if, um, you know, if I'm wrong, if you can show me that I'm wrong. And, you know, in any case, I, I don't even know how I got that, that far off what I was preaching here, but what verse were we on for that? Revive us again, Dad. Bring, being brought back, right? Going back to, to following the Lord. That's where this all came from. <laughs> you get in that position where if you've been kicked out or anything like that, um, or you've just backslidden, you know, you want to you wanna come back and, and, and seek the Lord and ask God for his help. Hey, bring me back into good graces, Lord, in good standing and show me the right way again. And you know what? We'd be happy to receive everybody back that uh, has fallen out for whatever reason. And um, yeah, let's keep reading here. Verse number seven. Show us thy mercy, O Lord, and grant us thy salvation. I will hear what God the Lord will speak, for he will speak peace unto his people and to his saints. But let them not turn again to folly. So we see the goodness of God here in the very beginning, talking about the forgiveness, God turning from his anger, the reception again, 
and seeking the Lord and, and, and looking for that revival. But then uh, we see in verse 8, this is also part of the process. Okay, I'm going to hear what the Lord will speak. Like, in, in part of your coming back from being chastened of the Lord, have your ears open to God, right? Par, par, probably what got you in trouble at the first place was not wanting to hear from God. And we see that happen with the children of Israel, especially, you know, they don't want to hear the word of the Lord. They want to serve their idols. They want to do this. They want to do that. They want to get into this. And they, they want to do what they want to do. They don't want to hear what God is telling them to do. So here we see, hey, I'm going to hear. I will hear what the Lord God will speak. For he will speak peace unto his people and to his saints. God brings peace. And look, the, the, the sin, whatever the sin is that got you into trouble and whatever that sin is that, that, that may have caused you to stray, I guarantee you your sin isn't going to bring you peace. It only brings trouble. One, it brings inherent trouble of sin. Just sin itself never yields good fruit. It never does, ever. That's just inherent to sin. If God didn't even get involved in any chastening, just sinning of itself has its own built-in ramifications of just curses, of no good fruit coming from sin. I mean, obviously the Bible says the wages of sin is death. I mean, that is the end. But on top of that, you have God who also, as if you're a child of God especially, will chasten and um, not hold you guiltless in that regard here on this earth and will make sure that you have to face your punishment. But we, we ought to listen to God because he's going to speak peace to his people and to his saints. He's going to help us to walk in the right way. He's going to show us the right way. And of course, that will be good for us. But then it says there, but let them not turn again to folly. All right, so you get to the point. Be like, okay, God, I'm sorry. I did wrong. Uh, please guide me. Please show me your way. I'm ready to hear. I'm ready to listen. When you get to that point, don't go now back like a dog returns to his vomit, right? And go back to your foolishness and back to your folly. Hey, you've already been through a lot. <laughs> you got back to this point. Don't go back again. Surely his salvation is nigh them that fear him. And that's key. Look, we, we want God to guide us and be with us. Then have the right fear of the Lord. And normally that's why people get back right with God after he's disciplined, after he's punished, because they start to realize, what was I thinking? <laughs> I, don't want, I don't want God's anger in my life. I want God blessing me and I'm going to turn back to him. And yeah, his salvation is nigh them that fear him that glory may dwell in our land. Verse 10, mercy and truth are met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. And of course, this is very poetic language. It's a psalm. It's a song. Um, but we see mercy and truth essentially going hand in hand, right? God's mercy and God's truth. The truth and mercy go hand in hand. You can't hide from your sin. You can't lie to God about your sin. You have to be truthful about it. Uh, you know, confess forsake, and then you'll find God's mercy. And similarly, righteousness and peace have kissed you. Righteousness and peace go hand in hand. Because if you're walking in righteousness, you'll know peace. You'll have peace. God will be with you. Truth shall spring out of the earth, and righteousness shall look down from heaven. Yea, the Lord shall give that which is good, and our land shall yield her increase. Now we're seeing the result of walking in righteousness and truth is the blessing of the Lord, the, the earth yielding her increase. And again, you know, I've been doing a lot of individual application of this, but the psalm is about the nation. This is talking about the, 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 the whole of Israel turning back to the Lord um, and we're seeing it, the, the playing out of the law and what God had said would happen when Moses gave them the law. And now we're seeing what does happen and them kind of being in the condition of, of returning to the Lord. And then, of course, verse 13 says, Righteousness shall go before him 
and shall set us in the way of his steps. Now, turn if you would to Ezekiel chapter 37, excuse me. This is one other passage that came to mind when I was meditating on this passage before, uh, before preaching tonight. Specifically there in verse number 6, talking about reviving us again, that thy people may rejoice in thee. Uh, Ezekiel 37, the first half of the passage is that, that famous passage about the, about the dry bones. Them bones, them bones, <laughs> right? So we got the, and, and it, we're going to read this if you don't know the story, but basically, you know, Ezekiel sees this, the, this valley, it's full of dead bones, and of course God uh, raises those bones, they all come together before his eyes and then the flesh and the sinews and the muscles, they all start to, to, to for, like men start being uh, animated or, or, or completed, right, from the bones now are becoming back like people. And then, of course, uh, God brings uh, the wind and, and they, they receive life. And the question is here, well, let's just read the passage Verse number one, the Bible says, The hand of the Lord was upon me and carried me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley, which was full of bones, and caused me to pass by them round about. And behold, there were very many in the open valley, and lo, they were very dry. And he said unto me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, thou knowest. Again, he said unto me, prophesy upon these bones and say unto them, O ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God unto these bones, behold, I will cause breath to enter into you and ye shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you and will bring up flesh upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you and ye shall live and ye shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded and as I prophesied, there was a noise, and behold, a shaking, and the bones came together, bone to his bone. And when I beheld, lo, the sinews and the flesh came up upon them, and the skin covered them above, but there was no breath in them. Then, he, then said he unto me, Prophesy unto the wind, prophesy, son of man, and say to the wind, Thus saith the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood up upon their feet, an exceeding great army. Then he said unto me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, Our bones are dried, and our hope is lost. We are cut off for our parts. Therefore prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. And ye shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up out of your graves and shall put my spirit in you and ye shall live and I shall place you in your own land. Then shall you know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, saith the Lord. Now, there is a lot in that passage, and I'm not going to just go through and, and give a, a verse by verse here on Ezekiel 37, but uh, I think right off the bat you could probably see why this popped into my mind as I'm studying Psalm 85, because one, he's referring to the nation of Israel, right? He's talking about Israel, about his people in general. Again, I think there's a lot of applications we can make with Ezekiel 37. I think it's very prophetic. Obviously, there's a reference to um, resurrection, and we could see, you know, that Israel just being resurrected, that the bones are dry. doesn't matter how long people have been dead, but when Jesus comes back, there's going to be a resurrection, and of course, there's going to be ruling and reigning from Jerusalem, and that his saints and his people are going to be ruling and reigning. So, there is definitely that application here. We could see that prophecy here, but I don't think that that's the only application we can make with with Ezekiel 37, I think as we see here, you know, uh, well, what about these people? They're dry bones. They're dead. They're good for nothing, right? They've been out for a long time. They've been dead. Well, can they live again? Can they be revived? Can they be revived again? And the answer is yes. God can use them again. God can bring them back to life. And here, um, you know, 
the, the, the nation of Israel, okay, you've, been, you've gone into captivity. Yeah, you've been punished. You could say, no, we're the laughing stock. We went into captivity or whatever. Now what can we do as a nation? You can still turn back to the Lord and he can still use you and he can breathe, breathe life into you again and you can go forward and continue to serve the Lord. This is a psalm of hope, of, of knowing that God is a God of mercy, knowing that God is a forgiving God. He wants you to turn to him. He wants you to have the desire to listen to him. As we saw that also in Psalm 85, I will hear the word of the Lord. I will listen, right? There's mercy and truth are bound together. And God can use you again. And as I mentioned, if, you, if you're still alive and breathing breath, God has a purpose for you. And God can use you and God wants to use you again. Such a, a, a great... This psalm, and, and you know, this psalm, I wasn't going to cover this necessarily tonight because there's multiple songs, psalms like this, and I think I covered it quite a while back in our, in our first go, uh, somewhere between Psalm 1 and 50, somewhere in the 40s, I think. The, the title for this psalm, it says, to the chief musician, a psalm for the sons of Korah. And there's, there's multiple, and I don't remember the exact number, if it's six or seven or eight or something, there's something where... There are, like, Psalm 84 also says a psalm for the sons of Korah. Psalm 84, Psalm 85, and there's a few more. Uh, psalm 87 and Psalm 88, and then in the 40s, there's also some as well. So I covered this once before, but if you remember Korah, this is that Korah of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. And Korah, Dathan, and Abiram were the ones that withstood Moses, and they're the ones that were saying, you know, they wanted the priesthood. Right? And Korah was a Levite. There was other, Dathan and Abiram were, I don't know if they were of Judah or some, some, one of the other tribes. But Korah was, was a Levite. It's like, look, you already have a job serving God. And now you just want to have the priesthood. And they wanted to just take this over. And be like, who is Moses? And who is Aaron? And who are these guys? You know, like, like they're, they're thinking they're something special over us. And they were... Um, they were wicked, right? And, and this is the story where God opens up the earth and just, they go straight to hell. Like they just get consumed, like them and their families. You know, Dathan and Byram, they're standing in their tents and they're just kind of standing there with their families and stuff and God just opens up the earth and they just fall straight down into hell. And Korah dies also, but the Bible's clear and, and I don't have the reference here. You can look it up later. Um, that the, the children of Korah though did not uh, go down to hell. Like it's, the Bible specifically mentions that his children did not die that way because David and Abiram, their whole household did die and they did go straight to hell. But Korah's children did not go down to hell. And now we see multiple references here. And I think it, it makes sense to me. And I don't treat these titles as the word of God, but I also don't treat them as being untrue either. Right? So when we see here, to the chief musician, a psalm for the sons of Korah, I don't treat that on the same level as the word of God, but, but here's the thing. It makes sense that this psalm would have that, right? That's talking about this, this hope and still being able to serve the Lord, you know, even as a, a son of Korah, because Korah was, does not have a good name <laughs> in Scripture, but obviously they're being referred to as the sons of Korah. So it's more of an inspirational. And I think the last time I brought this up, it was a similar, psalm, a similar type of a psalm that was giving hope and forgiveness and things like that uh, within the, the text of the psalm um, for, as, a, as a psalm for the sons of Korah. So these are great psalms here, this, this, this section. And if you notice, too, that the psalms are um, not, even though they're subdivided into five books, they're also, um, the, you know, the, the psalms that are next to each other very frequently have, have very similar themes to them. And that's why we kind of cover some of the same things week after week, just in general, the thematic, they're grouped together. But each one individually all has its own depth of truth to it. Praise the Lord for the psalms. Let's bow our heads, have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the book of psalms. And we thank you for... Uh, Psalm 85 and this, this great message of hope. And I pray that, uh, Lord, when we do sin, that we would quickly uh, seek your favor again, confess and forsake our sins, that we could continue to be used of you. And Lord, God forbid any of us would 
uh, really uh, get out of service to you and, and get involved in any type of grievous sin where to the point to where you, you really have to, to severely uh, chastise us, Lord. I pray that you would, you would help us to humble ourselves and, and show us the right way again and, and you know, get our attention to, to get us back on track. And Lord, that we wouldn't be too proud to go back to church and to, to serve you again, Lord, with all of our heart. God, we love you. We thank you so much for um, all that you've done for us and for being so loving and merciful unto us. Lord, help us to walk in the way of righteousness. Direct our paths. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.